Good morning, everyone. I am privileged today to introduce you to Dr. Al Runty. When I was looking through the information I heard about Al, I couldn't help but note that Ken Burns, who I personally think is one of the most amazing storytellers in our world today, thinks that Al is one of the most amazing storytellers in our world today regarding the national parks. That's impressive. Al Runty holds a PhD in American Environmental History from the University of California, Santa Barbara. He is the author of five critically acclaimed books on national parks, railroads, and the national environment. Allies of the Earth, Railroads and the Soul of Preservation, Trains of Discovery, Railroads and the Legacy of Our National Park are highly regarded, as is National Parks, the American Experience, which is considered the gold standard in the field. He was a principal consultant to Ken Burns during the production of the PBS documentary, The National Parks, America's Best Idea, and appeared in all six episodes of the Emmy award-winning series. Nationally and regionally, Dr. Runte has been an outspoken advocate for the preservation of America's wilderness landscape against urban and industrial blight. Al has been an active member of the Seattle Neighborhood Coalition, as well as other regional and national groups promoting protection of the environment through public education. Al comes from a family of educators. His mother served on the local school board and his brother taught high school math. Al's first job before earning his PhD was teaching high school history. Working seasonally for the National Park Service, Al trained interpretive rangers in Yosemite National Park and now speaks nationwide to audiences, young and old, on the need to protect our sacred lands. So on that note, I want to turn this talk over to Al so that we, like Ken Burns, can enjoy Al's wonderful storytelling. It's really something to look out into a crowd of masked faces. I, so, um, well, thank you, Dean Barine. I appreciate that introduction very much. And it's wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to be here in southern Utah, which I still consider the state of national parks, at a university that is renowned for having taught and protected the national parks. And I bring you greetings from Ken Burns and Dayton Duncan, who are good friends of yours. I understand that Dayton spoke here several years ago, and he wanted me to say a special hello. And so here we are, and, and let's be on our way and talk a little bit today about this wonderful system that we call our national parks and our national park idea. I do want to acknowledge, to start, Paul Patrick Duban, who is the reason that we are here a good friend of mine, a very dear friend of mine, his father, Dr. Jeffrey Duban, has endowed here at the university the Paul Patrick Duban Memorial Scholarship on behalf of the National Parks. Uh, Jeffrey, would you please stand up if you would and, and just acknowledge yourself here to the group? Thank you. Jeffrey is a classicist, by the way, and reminds me that our national parks got their start way back in ancient Greece and Rome with the sacred lands that were set aside. But we, the American people, were the ones that really perfected the idea. And so we wish Paul well now that he has gone on to study the universe. We wish him well and we thank him for his contribution to our national park idea. Here they are, our national parks. We are one of the few countries in the world that has this amount of open space. This is the primary natural units of our national park system. I couldn't even begin to get onto the map all of the historical sites we have and all of the other wonderful sites that we have in our national parks. But you get the idea that we've done something quite special in this country. And when you look at your lovely state of Utah, you can see again how much the national park idea means to all of you here at Southern Utah University. Christine, my wife and I are from Seattle currently. I'm born, born and raised in upstate New York. We have wonderful national parks there too. 
and it is an amazing legacy. And when you add in all the other public lands, the national forest and the national wildlife refuges, and all the open space that is managed by the Bureau of Land Management, you get the idea. We are very special. Think of it. We have 550 million acres of public lands in the United States. That is Alaska and two Californias, or if you want to keep it south of the 49th parallel, five and a half Californias worth of space. No other country in the world has this. Lots of countries have open space, but not this much public space. And we fight over it all the time, and that's one of our problems, because we are a nation that has its, uh, has its disagreements. But here is one thing that I hope that you will all take with you today. I am glad I shall never be young without wild country to be young in. Of what avail are 40 freedoms without a blank spot on the map? Aldo Leopold, University of Wisconsin wildlife biologist, one of our most distinguished conservationists, and that is one of my favorite quotes. Paul Patrick Dubin never left this earth without having blank spots on the map, and now Professor Ryan Paul is teaching you about these magnificent blank spots. We need to protect these. We need to keep them sacrosanct, no matter how big we grow and no matter how much our world changes, in the years ahead. And this was also our message as we began as a country. This is Thomas Jefferson, who was, of course, our third president and our author of the Declaration of Independence. Well, Thomas Jefferson had a problem. How could he prove to Europe that the young United States of America was worth something? He decided that the proof would be in nature. Europe was the past, the United States was the future. Why? Because we had these beautiful landscapes. Off of his left shoulder here, we see the natural bridge, which he called so beautiful, so elevated an arch. And that was Thomas Jefferson's argument. Yes, Europe had all of the ancient civilizations and all of the achievements of the modern world, from Shakespeare to Milton to the Sistine Chapel and all the wonders of the Renaissance but the United States was the future because we had a fresh landscape on which to discover our democracy and on which to grow. Or as the young nationalist Philip Furneaux put it, the Mississippi is the new Prince of Rivers in comparison to which the Nile is but a rivulet and the Danube but a ditch. <laughs> so there we were, we were on our way. Jeffrey and I love this painting, Kindred Spirits, by Asher Brown Durand, a student of Thomas Cole, who is pictured there with the easel and the brush. And he's with William Cullen Bryant of New York, who is one of the founders of Central Park in New York City. They're in a beautiful Catskill Mountain stream, and it was their ideal that nature, again, would be American culture. And Thomas Cole, the nominal founder of the Hudson River School of Art, brought these great canvases to light and taught Americans about the wonders and beauties of the American Northeast. But as you can see, these people, these gentlemen, are wearing street clothes. They're wearing city clothes. They're not out there tackling the wilderness. They are the ones who are falling in love with it. And their ideal in this beautiful painting by Frederick Church, Twilight in the Wilderness, is to bring to the United States these wonders of nature. And so the argument that America would never run out of beautiful horizons or beauty to see and to visit and not to exploit. Well, there's the other side. Here's the other side. And uh, look at this. I, just, just look at this for a minute. Here's this pioneer. He's in Aberdeen, Washington, up in our corner of the world. And look at, uh, one of my students years ago titled this picture by Darius Kinsey, Work. All that uh, she could see in this picture was work. And there's a lot of work to do. There's a lot of trees to cut down. Imagine he's trying to make a farmstead, a homestead out here in the middle of the wilderness. But he's had time to put up a fence. Isn't that interesting? I put up a fence. As if to say, inside is mine, outside is the wilderness. And yes, outside is the wilderness, but that is the thing that 
the artists of the Hudson River School were saying that we Americans ought to celebrate. But it was not celebratory to people who wanted to take it, to, to people who believed they needed it to make a living. And here's another painting or another picture by Darius Kinsey. This is a redwood tree in Humboldt County, California. And again, the men here are celebrating their conquest of a tree that is probably 800 or 1,000 years old. This is the other side of our culture. We are always arguing, and we see it here in the state of Utah, that maybe we have too much public land. Maybe we have too much open space. Maybe we need to exploit it. But I can tell you this, the best of our public lands have already been given over to development. And the late John Muir, late in his life, was so bitter that he put it this way, nothing tolerable is safe, however guarded. How can we have national parks if we are not willing to guard them and are not willing to protect them forever? So this is the tension that we have had. Those who see wilderness as something beautiful and something noble and something given to us by God, and those who see it also given to us by God, but for our use, something that we should turn into productivity and something on which to base our livings. Well, I grew up in New York State, as I said, and I will make this confession. We did not see Niagara Falls until we had been all the way west and back. It's one of those things, you know, you live right next door to something, in our case, 200 miles away, and you don't go there. And this gorgeous painting by Frederick Church of Niagara Falls uh, tells us why everybody should be proud of this great natural wonder. And this was America's natural wonder of the 19th century before the westward movement had really gotten started. This is what everybody went to see. This is what Europeans flocked from all over the world to see. And, and here it is in this gorgeous painting by Frederick Church, which in actual dimensions is four feet high by eight feet wide, and he really captured the magnificence of our Niagara Falls in this gorgeous painting. But if you'd gone there after the American Civil War, you would not have seen just this. You would have seen this. You would have seen development now all over the cataract, surrounding the falls. You can see the, the power plants going in. You can see the industrial district down to the far left from the American Falls. Niagara Falls are our great natural wonder, and we're letting it slip away and become a, a, a developed industrial site, and we're letting an industrial slum take hold south of the American Fall. And this was something that took Americans aback, took thinking Americans aback, and made them realize that maybe there was something wrong with Jefferson's argument that America was worth a voyage across the Atlantic, or something wrong with the young nationalist Philip Freneau, who had forgotten what was happening under his very nose in the beauties of the American Northeast. Well, we get our national park idea from this gentleman, George Catlin, who was an artist and who had gone to Niagara Falls to paint it in the late 1820s. And here you see one of his beautiful paintings of Niagara. And here you see one of his more honest paintings of Niagara. This is a bird's eye view. Now, he could not have done this in a balloon or in an airplane, it being 1829. He did this all from what he saw on the ground and extrapolated as if he were seeing it from above. And you can see the Horseshoe Fall and the American Fall on the bottom here. And you can see Goat Island between the falls. And what you notice is that all the forests are being cut. Orchards are going in. There are now farmhouses. There are now roads. And so Niagara Falls, this spectacular natural wonder, was actually being developed long before Americans had an idea of protecting it as a national park. Well, that was George Catlin's idea. We need to protect our great American landscape as a park. And he had an idea that we should take the whole third of the heartland of the country and declare it a nation's park containing man and beast and all the wild and freshness of their nature's beauty. That was his idea. And well, you know, it was a great idea. It was a great anthropological park. It would have been a marvelous experiment. He was understanding that what he had seen at Niagara Falls 
was going to happen all over the country. And of course, that's what happened. After the American Civil War in particular, we began to conquer the American West in, in full measure. Here we see Liberty stringing the telegraph key, the railroads following right behind her. You can see the miners with their shovels and picks heading west. And you can see this idea that America is going to move into the west. And of course, Utah was settled in the late 1840s by Brigham Young and his contingent. And the west began to change. On an interesting sidelight, Brigham Young also insisted on being one of the principal builders of the Union Pacific Railroad when it crossed Utah in 1867. So here came the railroad, here came people to settle, and now what? Is the whole country going to be developed? Is all the, of the country going to be subject to development? Or can we have some sacred spaces set together? And one of the fortunate things that happened was Americans stumbled into the Yosemite Valley in 1851. Oh, they weren't there to, to see the scenery. They were there to exterminate the Indians, the gold miners. But nonetheless, Yosemite was discovered in 1851, and the first party of tourists arrived in 1855. So discovery 1851, tourist 1855, they came in with this gentleman, James Mason Hutchins. He had failed in the gold fields, but he decided, I can strike gold in Yosemite Valley. All I have to do is get control of it, and I can turn Yosemite Valley into a gold mine of a very different sort. So here he is with the first party of tourists, well, actually a later party, but that's, uh, that's Mr. Hutchings off to the left. Beautiful Yosemite Falls, 2,425 feet in height, plunging from the rim down into the canyon. It's, a, it's just a magnificent place. And publicity about Yosemite began to circulate. And he had, oops, he went to wrong button. Sorry about that. And here you see this wonderful lithograph that the artist that came with his expedition uh, produced, Thomas Ayers. Yohamity know, Falls, he called it, back in uh, 1855 when he completed it. Yohamity know, Falls and the Yosemite Valley. And Americans began to understand through these engravings and lithographs what a beautiful, beautiful place this was. So he decided to start a newspaper, Hutchinson's California Magazine. And here it is, the Great Yosemite Valley was his very first article of his new newspaper, Hutchinson's California Magazine. And people began to realize, again, what a magnificent place this was. He purchased and modernized, modernized, sure, it was a shack. He purchased and modernized the upper hotel beneath Sentinel Rock in Yosemite Valley. Now, the point is, what he was doing was all illegal. He did not own Yosemite Valley. It was still owned by the federal government. But he thought he would apply the homestead laws to Yosemite Valley, and eventually the government would recognize his claim. Well, Albert Bierstadt, the artist, came in in 1863 and started producing his magnificent canvases. This one is five feet high by eight feet wide, Valley of the Yosemite, his first large canvas. And he began to argue as an artist that Yosemite ought to be preserved for the American people, not just for James Mason Hutchins and his ideas of tourism. After all, not only did we have the Yosemite Valley, we had the giant sequoias. Horace Greeley of the New York Tribune came out to Yosemite in 1859 and looked at the falls. He didn't care about those because they'd kind of dried up late in the summer. But he loved the giant sequoias and wrote for his readers that these trees were a very substantial size when David danced before the ark, when Aeneas fled the wreck of Ruin Troy, and when Solomon laid the foundations of his temple. In other words, Jefferson's argument again, these were America's monuments. This was what we were holding up to the world as proof of our coming greatness. Our only problem is we were also cutting them down. You know, we go to a Redwood National Park even today, and we always have the trees on their side, and they show you the rings, and they 
count back on the rings. Oh, here's when Columbus sailed. Here's when Christ was born. And on this tree, about 3,000 years old, you could go all the way back to ancient Troy. But how can you say you have a monument and then cut it down? You have to protect it. You have to save it. And here was James Mason Hutchins arguing that he owned the entirety of Yosemite Valley by virtue of having so-called discovered it. Well, we did something very unusual for a country. We decided that Yosemite Valley belonged to the American people. And in the winter of 1864, the United States Congress debated and passed an act for the preservation of Yosemite Valley and the Mariposa Grove of giant sequoias. What a marvelous thing that was. Abraham Lincoln signed it on June 30th of 1864. And again, knowing your history, you will understand that that was right in the bloodiest year of the American Civil War at the end of the Wilderness Spotsylvania Cold Harbor campaign that had cost the United States 100,000 of its sons north and south in 30 days of bloody conflict. And Lincoln still signed that bill and still looked to the future and said Yosemite and the giant sequoias belong to all Americans and will set them aside for public use, resort, and recreation, and we will hold them inalienable for all time. Marvelous, marvelous, marvelous. So that was the first act. And what happened to James Mason Hutchins? Well, he sued. He sued. He said, you can't do that. I own Yosemite Valley. He lost in the Supreme Court. Remember the recent things that have gone on the last few months and couple of years with our Supreme Court? Well, the Supreme Court can be very important. And in 1872, in the case Hutchins versus Lowe, upheld the right of the federal government to use its public lands for the public good. As the Supreme Court said, these still are public lands, and no one can force Congress or the American people to part with them. But what if the Supreme Court had ruled the other way? We probably would not have national parks. So Americans began to look at the West with different eyes. They began to look at the Rocky Mountains and began to realize that these are beautiful landscapes in their own right, here in another beautiful uh, Bierstadt painting from 1860, Lander's Peak. And they began to hear about another wonderland, which was called Yellowstone, or at least was referred to because of its yellow rocks. And the magazines of the Northeast began to, again, publicize this area, just as James Mason Hutchins had done with the Yosemite Valley. This gentleman, Thomas Moran, was invited to go on an expedition in 1871 to look into what the Yellowstone country was like in the northwest corner of Wyoming Territory. And he accepted the invitation to paint his glorious uh, artwork and let the American people know what needed to be preserved. Remember, we had no internet. We didn't have television. We didn't have movies. All we had was the printed press and art. And that's how Americans then learned about these magnificent places. Here in, is, uh, is the Castle Geyser in the Morning Glory Pool in one of Thomas Moran's beautiful paintings. And here, one of his studies for the Grand Canyon, the lower falls of the Yellowstone. And again, he was doing this all in 1871 on the government expedition. And this is the painting you all know and you all see in your national park literature, his glorious Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone, which he completed in 1872, June of 1872. And it was purchased by the federal government for $10,000 and hung in the Senate gallery. So it now hangs in the Smithsonian, and I hear it's on its way back to the Department of the Interior. But if you ever go to Washington, D.C., don't miss the opportunity to see these magnificent paintings in the flesh, in the original. Stand in front of them and get the feel of what your forebears felt and therefore turn to the protection of Yellowstone. And again, that was the idea. This ought to be protected. Another young frontier photographer, William Henry Jackson, was on the expedition of 1871. And he proved that Thomas Moran was not exaggerating 
with his glorious photographs here of the Grand Canyon and lower falls of the Yellowstone, twice the height of Niagara. We took comfort in that because we were in the process of losing Niagara at the time. The Mammoth Hot Springs, and by the way, that's Thomas Moran up there on the terrace exploring the Mammoth Hot Springs as William Henry Jackson takes his picture. They, were, they became very close friends. And then Ferdinand V. Hayden, who had led the expedition, was asked by Congress, if we were to protect the area around Yellowstone, what should we protect? And Ferdinand V. Hayden thought a minute and he said, why everything? Or else it'll become another Niagara Falls. We need to protect it all. And so he submitted as his boundaries to Congress, 3,500 square miles. Now that was a lot for a pioneer country. Yosemite Valley was only 57 square miles, the totality of everything in and around the gorge. Yellowstone, 3,500 square miles. Well, Congress said, why not? You know, it doesn't, doesn't appear to be anything up there except volcanoes and waterfalls and snow. And uh, it was, you know, high enough, kind of like Cedar City. It's actually about the height of Cedar City, 7,000 to 8,000 feet. But it was magnificent and became our first national park on March 1st of 1872. Signature of Ulysses S. Grant. Great Yellowstone. And now we had two parks. Yosemite, which had been granted actually to California for management, and the Yellowstone, March 1st of 1872. Well, there you see Yellowstone. And I show you this slide because this is the other exciting part of the story. Who was really behind these parks? Might you think the railroads that were going west thinking, wow, if we could get these people to go out there and see these beautiful parks, what a wonderful thing that would be. The Northern Pacific was indeed behind the establishment of Yellowstone, working very hard behind the scenes. And in 1883, when it was finished, Yellowstone was their destination. All of their maps, all of their brochures, always showed the Yellowstone National Park. Stay away from Europe this year and go to the Yellowstone Park. Be patriotic, be an American, okay? Don't you dare go to Europe until you've seen this beautiful place. And that was the call of the railroads. Be patriotic, be an American. People arrived on the train at Gardner starting in 1883. Actually, Cinnabar, which was a little farther north, but Gardner would become the main station. You see everybody getting off the train and getting onto the stagecoaches and heading up the hill, okay, that's how you traveled. I've always wondered which were the cheap seats, the ones on the top where if you fell you broke your neck, or the ones down inside where, well, you know, you got to smell the horse's exhaust. Uh, but uh, so they arrived then at the National Hotel at the Mammoth Hot Springs. The railroad put in this hotel in 1883, 400 rooms, so you can see how they were thinking, and people began to arrive. Now, the 1883 is not seven years after Custer's demise at Little Bighorn. So think of it. This is all happening very, very fast. And again, I, I don't know about writing up uh, in the top, but that's how people saw Yellowstone back uh, in, until the motor stages that began to come in in the 19-teens. You went around in these great Concord stages. And of course, the railroad had to give you a nice place to stay, right? You know, Best Western Plus? Nah, we're gonna give you Old Faithful Inn by the Seattle artist Robert Reamer. And Robert Reamer, the architect, designed this gorgeous palace in the wilderness, this palace that, that people could enjoy, enjoy in the style to which they had grown accustomed back in the Eastern United States. They had wonderful advertising, I love this. Won it on eBay. Um, if you have any in your attic, you can always send them to me or you can put them up on eBay yourself. They are, uh, one, this is the guidebook from 1897, Alice in Wonderland and she's riding the back of the eagle above the Grand Canyon and lower falls of the Yellowstone. Americans were excited. And of course, the people who could afford to do this were generally the wealthy 
but you get the idea. Americans were excited about the wonders and beauties of the American West. And then John Muir. John Muir, the young poet and botanist who had gone to Yosemite in 1869, and uh, he, he, growing older in age, realized that Yosemite was in danger again. Yosemite now endangered by what was happening in the high country surrounding the valley. And so he proposed that there be a large national park surrounding the original grant of 1864. The Southern Pacific Railroad thought that was a good idea, not only for tourism, but for the protection of watersheds, and also wanted to save the big trees the giant sequoias, they were still being cut down where they were not being saved. This one, the Mark Twain tree, was cut down for the Chicago Exposition of 1893. And here you see these pioneers. It was determined that the tree was 2,700 years old, but was nonetheless cut down for the World's Fair of 1893. And John Muir and the Southern Pacific Railroad thought this was sacrilege. Again, you don't destroy monuments. You don't destroy your living antiquity, having argued that this is your culture. The General Sherman tree was slated for preservation in the Great Sequoia National Park, also from 1890, when Yosemite was being considered, and the General Grant tree. So they're still preserving objects, but you're getting the idea. Once in a while, they will expand out to make sure they have all the objects protected as they did in Yellowstone. So as of September of 1890, the United States had three more national parks, Yosemite, Sequoia, and General Grant. Now five, or rather four, national parks in the system. The fifth was Mount Rainier. Again, Northern Pacific Railroad wanted this to happen and uh, celebrated it in its poster art and in its advertising. Uh, yes, I do have this in my collection. No, I, I will not be selling it. <laughs> but I might be giving it to this university at some point because I do have a marvelous collection of these things since, again, they are the bridge to the public that was being used 150 years ago. Crater Lake became a national park, Western Oregon in 1902. You see this beautiful painting by the artist Maurice Logan. See the bears down down in the bottom, and again, you would see these posters in the ticket shops and in the, and, and in the places where people went to buy railroad tickets and to get their literature when they were planning their vacations. And then Theodore Roosevelt, 26th President of the United States, decided in May of, actually in March of 1903, that he would take a two-month tour of the American West. And he wrote to John Muir, who's on his immediate left, our right, and he said, I want to spend four days in Yosemite. I want to see them only with you. I want to see this beautiful place only with you. And the Secret Service, and all the photographers, and everybody else who, of course, were coming along for the ride. But there you see, it's one of the most famous pictures in American history. Theodore Roosevelt, and he did so much for the national parks and so much for the public lands by making sure that they were retained in federal ownership. And John Muir, the founder of the Sierra Club and the gifted, gifted uh, poet and writer who gave us the idea of the Yosemite National Park in 1890. So there they are. And Roosevelt visited all six parks, all six parks at the time. Well, he had just signed Crater Lake. And he also visited the Grand Canyon, which was not yet a national park. And he took two months to do it. And as Ken and Dayton point out in their magnificent series, he spent two weeks in Yellowstone alone. What American president today spends that kind of time in these beautiful public lands? That, again, is something that we're missing in the 21st century that we very much had in the 20th. Well, Roosevelt set aside preserving national monuments under a new act for the preservation of American antiquities. He started with Devil's Tower in Wyoming, and then he went over to the Grand Canyon and said, I loved it. Leave it as it is. For your children and children's children and all who come after you is one of the great sights that every American should see. So I'll make it a national monument. And he did it by proclamation, just 
took out his pen, signed it, and withdrew that land from ownership and occupation under the land laws of the United States, and we had Grand Canyon National Monument on its way to becoming Grand Canyon National Park. And again, the railroad was there, in this case, the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe. I just love this particular ad. Shows our lovely Gibson girl and the handsome ranger. You go to uh, the Grand Canyon and he's pointing to his left and his horse is looking straight ahead and she's not giving him the time of day. So, so what can you say? But you get the idea. This is how Americans learned about their national parks and the guidebooks. They were always gorgeous, colorful paintings and lots of illustrations and again, Titan of Chasms, which was the Santa Fe's guidebook all through the early 1920s. They had arrived actually at the Grand Canyon even before it had been proclaimed a national monument. The white men are coming, of course, that's who traveled. And in 1910, Glacier became a national park in northern Montana. And the Great Northern Railway built the Great House, as the Indians called it. And you see again the advertising. It's so experience oriented. And then the shoe drops. The shoe is the Hetch Hetchy Valley in the great Yosemite National Park, the second Yosemite. San Francisco says we need this valley as a water supply. John Muir says turn Hetch Hetchy into a water tank as well dam the nation's cathedrals and turn them into water tanks. But San Francisco said, you said it yourself, Mr. Muir, the nation has two Yosemites. We need one of them. And John Muir and the Sierra Club, incensed, led the battle for the preservation of the Hetch Hetchy Valley as itself sacred to Yosemite National Park. Well, the battle goes on, as, uh, as Professor Paul will remind you, his classes, the battle went on for many, many years and was resolved in 1913, even though the artist had again shown what a glorious valley this was. In 1913, the Raker Act transferred the Hetch Hetchy Valley out of Yosemite National Park and awarded it to San Francisco for its water and power supply. It was the fight that had cost John Muir his legacy, he felt, and in his bitterness to pen, nothing dollarable is safe, however guarded. And there it is today, inundated. It's not the great valley of nature anymore. It is indeed San Francisco's water supply, wonderful water. But it forced people back then, 100 years ago, to realize that if we were going to keep our national parks, we had to be far more vigilant than we were being at the time we had to be far more aware of the forces of commerce and what they portended for our national parks. And the gentleman who led the battle in the East was J. Horace McFarland of the American Civic Association. He was leading a battle, again, for the preservation of, are you surprised, Niagara Falls, which by the early 20th century was being rimmed by reservoirs and canals to actually drain the water it didn't even go over the falls anymore. It went downstream of the falls to be used for power production. There was even talk that there would be a waterless Niagara at some point. Here's a political cartoon from Punch Magazine. See America first, it's going fast. And Americans were actually contemplating that Niagara Falls would be waterless. And guess what? After midnight, they virtually turned it off, even now. After the tourists are gone and the light show is over, they take most of the water and send it down around the falls into these power plants and into these reservoirs for water storage. Think of it. Niagara Falls is Niagara, you know, trickle after midnight. And then at 6 a.m. when the sun comes up and the tourists start to come back, they turn it back on. They can do that now. The engineers can do that. Well, J. Horse McFarland did not want that to happen in the national parks. And so he joined with John Muir and the railroads. Of course, the railroads, they're taking people west. This is the era before the airplane and before the automobile. You got west by taking the train. When my grandfather homesteaded in South Dakota, he came over from New York City by train. He got there by train. 
And of course, you had to have your hats, you know. All the ladies, look at some of those hats, I'll tell you. It's really, it's really something. And of course, mountain climbing, another glorious sport. The railroads wanted people to get out there and to exercise. Because to do that, they would have to buy a ticket. They would have to buy passage on the railroad. And you can see in this advertising how wonderful it was, the experiences of the national parks. And there you are. You don't have to go to Switzerland. It's right here in Glacier National Park. I'm like, is it not true? Do those young ladies not look as if they're in Switzerland? So there they are, now on Social Security, all, all three of them, but uh, the picture was taken in 1935 at St. Mary's Lake out in, out in Glacier National Park. But you see once again how critical it was that there be an experience in these parks that said something other than economic development. And it was the Great Northern Railroad that coined the phrase, see America first. Or as uh, it was under Dinah Shore, see the USA in your Chevrolet, but see the USA before you see anything else. And so the railroads threw a huge fair in 1915. Actually, it was a fair authorized by Congress in celebration of the completion of the Panama Canal. And they threw it in San Francisco and they celebrated the national parks. They recreated Yellowstone right down to every stick of the Old Faithful Inn. They recreated Yellow, that's Yellowstone, San Francisco, not Yellowstone, Wyoming. Here's the exhibit from the air, from the aeroscope. They had the Grand Canyon, they had the pools, the Old Faithful geyser went off every hour on the hour. And not to be outdone, the Santa Fe Railway created the Grand Canyon Imagine making a model of the Grand Canyon, six acres, six football fields in extent. And you went around the Grand Canyon on this little train and you stopped at all the observation points and looked down into the Grand Canyon. So if it hadn't been for the railroads, we might not have gotten our National Park Service because they and your Senator Reed Smoot of Utah were the ones that were behind the National Park Service established August 25th of 1916. And the first director of the National Park Service had a long Utah history as well in the borax and mining industry. He was Stephen T. Mather. When he became the first director of the Park Service, he immediately went to work again with the railroads, said, help me develop the parks, help me publicize the parks, and help me get more national parks. And there you see some happy travelers on the Yellowstone Comet. They'll spend two nights and three days getting to Yellowstone. But what a time they will have taking the train west here in 1930. And of course, home, Union Pacific country. The train came right here into your lovely town and thousands of tourists every summer went off on their junket through the beautiful Utah National Parks and the north rim of the Grand Canyon the most enchanting vacation region on earth, canyons of tremendous depth, mountains of majestic height, and my favorite railroad ad of all time, your Bryce Canyon. In Bryce Canyon, our mammoth amphitheaters are realistic, gorgeously colored sculpture and architecture, queens, princes and potentates, ogres and fairies, ruined oriental cities, castles and cathedrals of the Middle Ages. Why are you going to Europe? It's all right here in Utah, in Bryce Canyon National Park. Well, the National Park idea needed to go east and did in the Shenandoah Valley. It wasn't as spectacular, but again, the railroads wanted it and the country believed it needed to preserve some eastern landscapes. Again, not as spectacular as the Rockies, but beautiful in its own right. Shenandoah and Great Smoky Mountains National Parks came into the system in the 1920s the land of the sky, as the Southern Railway called it. And again, not as wild, not quite as spectacular, but still very, very beautiful. Huggins Hell, Great Smokies Mountain National Park, is very wild. And the National Park idea made its way into the east. The problem was that wildlife was being left out of the whole experience. Wildlife was, again, a discovery of the national parks in their maturity 
not in their infancy. And the reason that wildlife was itself under duress was because travel to the parks was changing. Don't step on the gas. It's 3,214 feet straight down. And there's no stoplight. Uh, <laughs> you can see that Mr. Lippincott is cheating. He's got a little wooden spike there behind the wheel. But this is a, the very spot where Theodore Roosevelt and John Muir stood three years later in 1903. So we began to change how we saw the national parks because of the automobile. Uh, Professor Paul says he loves Coca-Cola. Well, here it is, another old faithful, the pause that refreshes. Who's looking at the geyser? They're all looking at the bears and they're all being distracted. Things are changing in the national parks. Here's a big distraction. When one of these things gets in your way, you better stop, well, you better stop, but getting out and taking a picture could be dangerous. And so, you know, there were still things to learn. The bear feeding shows. Park Service had bear feeding shows. So you didn't have to uh, see the bears in the wild. You could go to the bear feeding show and they would be fed on cue. And this gentleman, Joseph Grinnell, from a university like Southern Utah University, only in this case, the University of California, Berkeley said, this is wrong. Wildlife should be wild and seen from a distance. And so this is why universities are important in the national park idea, because here we have people who have the time to contemplate and think about what is right, not just what is expedient. And Joseph Grinnell said, we need to have better wildlife protection in our parks. And we need to bring the parks into ecological compliance for it, like the Grand Teton National Park. Beautiful park, but just the mountains in 1929. What about Jackson Hole, where the elk gathered? It was not protected, and it needed to be protected, and would not be protected until an Eastern philanthropist by the name of John D. Rockefeller Jr. spent over a million dollars buying old homesteads in the valley and later give, gave them to the federal government to round out Grand Teton National Park with the acquisition and inclusion of Jackson Hole. So a new maturity again coming to the park idea. And the granddaddy of all biological parks in the United States, Everglades. A swamp is a swamp. I can see that the Everglades is not as ugly and repulsive as other swamps I have seen, but it is yet a long ways from being fit to elevate into that glorious class of wonderlands we call the national parks. That was William T. Hornaday, the so-called father of wildlife conservation, dismissing the Everglades because it saved wildlife. Well, Congress did not dismiss it. And in 1934, made it our first actual wilderness park. And all for the glory and beauty of the wildlife not just for the beauty of the scenery. So Everglades National Park, now home to the Burmese Python, unfortunately, was added to the park system and dedicated in 1947. And out on Olympic Peninsula, our country, where Christine and I live in Seattle, Olympic National Park, sure, the beautiful mountains, no problem making those a national park, but what about the trees, the rainforest? We need that as well for the glory and protection of the entire ecosystem. And so the government again decided that, ev that, the, that the Everglades National Park being the model should extend to Olympic National Park and include the rainforest. And here's the park, here are the boundaries of the park, and here's an aerial view showing how those boundaries match exactly. Everything around the park has been logged sometimes two and three times only inside the park do we have the virgin rainforest of the Pacific Northwest. So here we are today, all the forces of nature without the element of surprise, being sold again that our electronic devices and our cars and all of our, all of our wonders of mankind are more important than the wonders and beauty of nature. By the way, I hope that guy didn't get a ticket. He's parking out of bounds there on the side of the the park. Well, you know this place. It's right next door. Glen Canyon. Its gates closed in 1963. But maybe you don't know this painting by Norman Rockwell. He used to do all the paintings for the Saturday 
Evening Post. He doesn't look too happy. The Indian family with their slooped shoulders doesn't look too happy, nor do the eagles soaring above. I think Mr. Rockwell is telling us that in taming our river, we also destroyed a wilderness. And that was also proposed for the Grand Canyon. I don't know how many of you realize it, but in the 1960s, our then Secretary of the Interior, Stuart Lee Udall, there on our right, proposed damming the Grand Canyon at two spots so that there would have been no free-flowing Colorado River again through the American Southwest. He proposed it for water and power for the Southwest, Phoenix and Los Angeles in particular. Well, the conservationists took up the battle. I was among them. Save the Grand Canyon, said the Sierra Club. The Bureau of Reclamation said, save the Grand Canyon. We're going to make it more democratic. You'll be able to take a boat into the Grand Canyon. You'll be able to get close and personal with the canyon walls. Sierra Club asked in one of its most famous ads of all time, should we also flood the Sistine Chapel so tourists can get near the ceiling? That's what saved the Grand Canyon. That ad right there by David Brower and the Sierra Club. That's what saved the Grand Canyon for us, for posterity. Fortunately, we couldn't save all the redwoods, a great redwood national park. And you can see the boundary right, the, right down to the cutting of the redwoods, another big battle from the 1960s. A great jet port was supposed to go in at the Everglades, but the SST was stopped and the jet port was never fully completed, but stop and think what that would have done to the Everglades. And then the battle for Alaska, the great wilderness national parks of Alaska, shown here in Time Magazine, which was culminated in 1980 with the Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act. And then the Secretary of the Interior, well, you know, good old James Watt, our good old buddy from the Reagan years, and he's, again, another example of this idea that the public land should be developed. And the cartoonist had a field day with him. Here's one of my favorites. Never mind the apples. How do you like to open this place? To oil and gas drilling. And I used to have these on my office wall at the University of Washington. So all my students coming for office hours could be entertained by all these cartoons that were coming out from the era of James Watt. Well, here we go again, right? The Green New Deal, Green New Deal. I'm looking forward to it with uh, great anticipation. I only wish that we were thinking about railroads and not just about wind turbines. You know, I, I don't know how green that is. It may seem green to the planet, but at the same time, it's very destructive of the landscape, as are the solar power plants, destructive of the landscape. Maybe you good people here at Southern Utah University can think of some other ways that we can generate power. And I do hope that you support, among other things, going back to railroads as a primary form of transportation, because those really are green. And now the Leopold again reminds us what the challenge is in the years ahead. We need to examine each question in terms of what is ethically and aesthetically right, as well as what is economically expedient. A thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity stability and beauty of the biotic community, it is wrong when it tends otherwise. We need to save beauty and biology, not just the atmosphere. And that's part of it. What do you think cleans the atmosphere, if not the biology of our planet? And of course, history. Are we going to forgive ourselves? Are we going to forgive our forebears for being imperfect people? Washington, yes, was a slave owner. 156 slaves, the largest slaveholder in Virginia. He also went away from his plantation for eight years and served in the front lines of the Continental Army to bring this country freedom. Can we not forgive what he had as a blind spot, which the entire world had, which the entire world had at the time? Do we really want to take down all these statues at Gettysburg, another one of our great national parks? Is that what we want to do? Or can we let these people rest in peace and recognize that the battles that they fought were theirs to fight and we were not there to serve with them? So why do we shake our finger at the past and insist they should have been better people? They knew it. 
They fought for it. They died for it. 700,000 in the American Civil War alone. Here at the, at the high point of the Confederacy, men died by the dozens a minute for the democracy that we have today. And our National Park Service interprets it and reminds us, again, we weren't there to serve with them, so who are we to criticize? In any event, I love this line from, uh, from uh, this, this wonderful book by Professor Paul and his, and his associate writer, um, Janet Sieg Miller. I remember in July, around the 4th of July, we looked, hiked down to the trail and sat clear down on the trail and just sat there and looked at the park in the moonlight. Then we sang all these patriotic songs. You're a grand old flag. And America the Beautiful, we just did it because we loved our country and we loved the outdoors and we loved nature and we were happy to be alive. It was a lovely time to be alive. Well, that's the way I felt serving with my colleagues in the National Park Service in Yosemite Valley, all of these fine young people. And I don't know about you, but I think that's a pretty diverse photograph. If we're concerned about diversity, I see men and women and I see my Hispanic colleagues, and my African-American colleagues, and my Miwok Indian colleagues. And this is 1983. We, we're doing a good job. Let's be kind to ourselves and try to do an even better job. And many of these young people went on to serve in the National Park Service, and I have high hopes for Southern Utah University sending many of its graduates on to the National Park Service and Forest Service and Fish and Wildlife Service, where you too will serve your country. And what could be more nobler to do than that? So life at its best, national parks. You're doing your part. It's wonderful. It's wonderful to come here and see all your faces and know that you're interested and concerned about the future of your parks. And wonderful to hear from all of your professors and, and administrators what you're doing to make your program even better yet. We'll do our part. We'll go out there and hustle up the, uh, the donors. We'll find them. We'll build it. Thank you very much.